Radio for Readers Bookmark. On the next bookmark, how does a long-term fiction writer move over to children's books? Mary Barr on the next bookmark. Mary Barr is the author of a number of fictional books and children's books. She joins us now from British Columbia. Mary, thanks for being with us on Bookmark. Thank you for having me, Mark. How long did it take you to make the transfer from strictly fiction to children's books, and was there something that motivated you to do that? Well, I've always wanted to do children's books because I think I still believe in magic. And I found the transformation to balance out my adult fiction writing very nicely. Uh, each year I would write an adult book, which are fairly complex. There's a lot of characters. There's a lot of plot lines going together. And then I would write a children's book, which would have one main character, one plot line, and always a happy ending. So it, it just really rounded out the fiction, and I think it kept me more grounded. Are any of these fictional characters based on your experiences as a child or children that you came to know or people you became to know during your adult life? There is a sprinkling of myself in there, especially from the geology angle. I like to write about places that I've been. Uh, not always, sometimes the places are fictitious, but quite often places I've been or places I've lived in the past so that I have a real handle on, on where I am and the surroundings at the time. Uh, with the characters, sometimes I use names if I hear a name that I like. Uh, I will use it, but I will change the character around. So maybe the person I meet is a, is a male, and I will use that character as a female so that there's absolutely no, uh, there's nothing in common with, with the original character. But yes, I do. I draw a little on life. Most of it comes from my imagination. For you, you have said often that storytelling is an art. Did it take you a long time to come to this art? I got my first literary prize when I was seven years old and it was something that I found easy to do and I believe that whatever you find easy to do in life, that's what you should follow. Uh, it, otherwise I would be doing something like accounting which I have no aptitude for. So I found writing, uh, literature, storytelling, something that I love doing and it got me out of bed in the morning and I couldn't wait to get out and create the characters and create the storyline. So just something I love doing and no, it wasn't hard at all. This book, The Trouble with Philly Tucker, is a combination of several different things that happens to a young lady, including just a touch of witchcraft. Did you put the, if you'll pardon the expression, the governors on this? Because we hear there's a lot of talk now about overdoing witchcraft, but giving just a taste of it. In this book, you get a very, I think, benign taste of witchcraft. Well, Philly Tucker is a young girl, and witchcraft is in her DNA, so it's in her family, and it's expected of her. But like most young girls who are about to turn 10 years old, she wants to go out and play. She wants to have fun. She doesn't want to learn witchcraft, and she doesn't really care about it. But it's something that she has to do, and of course, Philly Tucker is a good witch. But at 10 years old, she can't even manage to conjure up a small spell like tidying the house or doing her chores or getting dressed in the morning. So she really hasn't learned her spells at all. And then when she needs to use them, they all turn out wrong. And there's some quite hilarious uh, instances that come from that. So yeah, Philly Tucker's a good witch. Her family are a good witch. And later on in the book, towards the end of the book, I won't give the ending away, but Grandma Copperbottom, who Philly lives with, uh, she goes out and, and she really shows Philly what witchcraft is about. And I think it opens Philly's eyes to, to what a wonderful world there is out there when you can believe in magic. You know, the names are highly imaginative. As I was getting ready for this interview, I'm like, how did she come up with these names? Is it part of your DNA? <laughs> I think so. I think the names have to be wonderful. I think the characters have to be unforgettable, but they've got to have names that, that just really stay with you. And, and you don't want a name that somebody else has, because otherwise, in your mind, you're relating that character to someone that you already know. So the, the names are very English um, and they're, they're made to stay in your mind, hopefully like the characters will. Okay, tell us about the two stories you've written, The Ditch Dog, The Hedge Cat. 
which I have right here. And we'll have all of our viewers be able to find these books and we'll show them and you can find them on Kindle. But tell us these two stories. Okay, the, the idea behind The Ditch Dog and The Hedge Cat, we decided to put two stories into one book uh, just because the economy at, at this time when I published that was not particularly strong. Now, these are two separate animal adventure stories. The first one is about a charming dog, a cocker spaniel called uh, Ditto. And he's actually a stray dog. He's been abandoned which is very sad, but Ditto has a wonderful personality. He's happy, he's easygoing, he has a wonderful amount of animal friends, and of course they, they all talk. So the reader is getting the story through the animal's mouths. They're actually telling the story, so it's not a person telling it, it's actually Ditto and, and his friends that are telling it. And Ditto, like all my children's books uh, in this particular story, there is a moral, which I think is very important to get through to children these days. And in Ditto, the Ditch Dog, uh, the moral is finding love. Ditto has been abandoned and he doesn't want another home. He doesn't want to be hurt again. He doesn't want to have his heart broken. So everyone tries to take him and he says, no, I, I'm happy the way I am. And as you read the book, you find out he's not really happy the way he is. But he's putting on a brave front like so many of us do. And in the end, uh, he finds a family that he just has to go with because he realizes that they need him as much as he needs them. And so Ditto finds a loving home in the end. Tell us about, uh, I believe it's called a Rosebud in December, uh, <laughs> which I have not read yet. But tell us about that. A Rosebud in December is a novella. It's quite a long novella. And... This is something I had to write because I, I've always had a fascination with people that are born as identical twins and the twin connection that they have. And A Rosebud in December is about Lilybud and Rosemary. Together they become Rosebud. And two girls live as one. They, they achieve as one. Uh, they come from a very, very poor background on the wrong side of the tracks, extremely poor. They have a violent upbringing and they decide to get away, uh, which they do. And, and you have to admire their motivation and their, their tenacity to get out there and achieve when they come from nothing. Um, and as the story goes on, I won't give it away, but they end up meeting a very prominent and very well-off man called Hudson Black. And Hudson Black has everything that they don't. And instead of Hudson Black marrying one of these girls, unbeknown to him, he marries both of them. He marries Rosebud. He doesn't marry Lilybud or Rosemary. He, he marries Rosebud, and as they've done with their whole entire life, they alternate each day. So one lives a day while the other one stands on the sidelines. And this is, this is how the concept of the whole book goes. There, there are some violent times in the book when they go back to their original beginnings, uh, but it's a unique and different concept, and I know it's one that has grabbed my readers considerably in the past, and I really enjoyed writing this book. I, I love the whole concept. The concept of twins is fascinating. In the children's series, Mary, do you try to write for the same age demographic, say 8 to 14? Is that a target you consistently use, or does it vary? Uh, you know, I, the youngest book I've, I've written is The Sturgeon General and the Catfish. And that took me an afternoon to write last year, and it was to go into my filing cabinet and be forgotten. But I let one person read it, and... Uh, the rest is history, but that's the youngest demographic I've written for. Um, and I find any younger than that, I'm not having a storyline. That's what I love doing. I'm a storyteller. So any younger than that, they need picture, picture books with not much of a storyline. So I suppose that the five years and up is my preferred demographic. I have also written some young adult books, which are quite fascinating and I loved writing them as well but yeah that that would be the youngest demographic I go with and books like uh, The Ditch Dog and the Hedge Cat 
In the Hedge Cat, the second book is about Giggles, who is a little house cat. And what I've tried to do is write for the children um, the animal adventure stories, but one is about a dog and one is about a cat. So they can relate to either of the pets that they have in their homes. And The Sturgeon General and the Catfish, which is my youngest book, is actually set under the ocean. So it, it's a completely different background again. Tell us about the oyster tapper. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, <laughs> the oyster tapper basically follows two childhood friends and it takes them from their younger years uh, through to when they ride dune buggies and, and they have lots of fun growing up. And then it takes them into their older years where one of them has a very, very unusual gift. One of these boys' fathers ha owns an oyster factory and he has done all his life. And uh, as the boys get older, they find that one of them has the propensity to know which oysters have pearls inside. And this brings them a lot of riches and a complete change in life. So The Oyster Tap is a, a rather unusual book with a rather unusual subject. I think it was three years ago you wrote Kippy Schofield. Am I right on that? Yes, yeah, Kippy Schofield. I love Kippy Schofield. Now, Kippy Schofield is the male version of Philly Tucker. And Kippy Schofield is also a 10 year old boy. Uh, the book Kippy Schofield, I think, would be a slightly older demographic than Philly Tucker just because of the subject matter. Uh, Philly Tucker takes you on a ride, but it's a very soft ride. Whereas Kippy Schofield, there's, there's more life issues in the book uh, that I think maybe an older child could relate to. But there's lots of magic when he meets the fan fantastical cat. He goes on lots of magic journeys and it's it's a fabulous book where when you read it, it really gives you a feel good feeling. So I think if anyone likes Philly Tucker, uh, definitely get Kippy Schofield's Adventures with the Fantastical Cat. Are all of your books available on Kindle? I know you can get some at Amazon, but are they all available on Kindle? Philly Tucker is only available on Amazon. I have six books on Kindle, and Kippy Schofield is one of the books on Kindle. He's my only children's book actually on Kindle at this time. The rest are all adult fiction. You know, you have such a delightful manner in which you present your books. Have you been a storyteller, and have you gone to storytelling festivals yourself? I have gone to storytelling festivals. I, I've gone to schools. I've uh, read audio books on air, and... I love it because I just think that a story can take you away into another world. And no matter what's happening in your day-to-day -day life, whether it's good or bad, a story takes you away into another world. And that's one of the things I like about being an author. All the characters that I create come out of my head. Every single character is me. Whether they're good, whether they're bad, uh, whether you love them or whether you hate them, they, they all come out of my head. And when I'm writing these stories, sometimes I come to a, a stage uh, in my adult stories, obviously, where one of the characters uh, gets killed off or several characters get killed off. And you've got to love these characters so much. And uh, I, I'm actually shedding a tear while I'm, while I'm writing about their demise. So I am every single one of these characters. And that's what I love about storytelling. I can be anything I want to be. Mary, I know you've done a lot of book signings in the last few days. What do people say to you at these book signings when you meet them? <laughs> I, I've done children's book signings, and I love meeting the children. Uh, most of them are very respectful, and they come up and they say, oh, I love reading your books. You're our favorite author. And it's just it's such a pleasure to deal with them because they, they know the book better than what I know it, and they want to know what else I've written. And it's just a delight, especially the age groups, the, the little 8 to 10-year-olds. And I had one little boy uh, this weekend that came up to me and he was a, a little boy that was very active to say the least and he's jumping around on the other side of, of the desk uh, wanting to read Fully Tucker and he's got the book and he's, he's jumping up and down with it and all of a sudden there's this crash and he disappears over the other side of the desk 
and everyone around us stopped and we thought, oh goodness, he's hurt himself. And there was silence for a few seconds and I'm, I'm trying to look over the desk to see him on the floor. The next moment this, this figure and this little hand comes up and he says, I'm okay. <laughs> So yeah, just just very entertaining. Love love the children, and sometimes when you're you're out, the little children recognise you and they they wave at you and and they they sort of send you kisses, and you don't really know who they are, but it's such a nice feeling. I want to squeeze this in because before you got into children's books, I think around 2007, <laughs> you were a, a big writer of murder mysteries, and I've always wanted to ask a person such as yourself, what is it about putting the murder mystery together? that people who watch you in this interview are going to want to go for those. Is there something about putting that story together that drives you? Uh, murder mysteries is something I've always been interested in. I've, I've loved it. My father loved murder mysteries. And it's just something I've, I've always wanted to write. I like the, the idea of uh, the plot line. I, I like the idea of looking at the plot line from many different angles, from the angle of the detective, uh, from the angle of the heroine. And in all my murder mysteries, I, I tend to have several different plot lines coming together. So I don't have one character going through the book, or I, I do seldom, uh, but usually I have several different characters, and these are the main characters that are involved in the murder mystery. So by the time the actual murder happens, um, you're feeling sympathy and empathy for perhaps people that are not good people, but you've got to know them, you've got to know their life, and you've got to know what's driven them to this particular stage where they've committed a crime. And I also like to put uh, the detective in there as well, so that you can see a little bit from the detective's angle. My books are not detective books. Uh, they can be called crime books on, on some occasions, but I do think that the detective's angle in a small way is important and it certainly adds to the plot line. Give us a few titles of those murder mysteries in case our viewers would like to research and perhaps order. What's available for people to get? Uh, well, on Kindle at the moment, we have Mrs. Dolly Mooch's Daughters, which is a very different book. Um, it's been very well received. It's, Mrs. Dolly Mooch is a doll maker. She makes porcelain dolls. And she's a German lady who is in England, and she's been a nanny to a fairly elite family. Now, Mrs. Dolly Moocher is not a nice person. Uh, each year when she makes her new porcelain dolls, which are very, very successful, she's known all over the world for these collectible porcelain dolls, uh, she makes them on the image of a living person. So these dolls are made totally to the image of the living person, right down to their designer clothes and and what they look like, the colour of their hair, their eye colour, their skin colour. And towards the end of the book we, we find out that she's doing this uh, by be, being a serial murderer, which is very sad. That's how she gets the clay mask and the image for her children, uh, sorry, her dolls, by actually murdering attractive young women. Okay, and we can direct people to your website as well where people can read more Please, about yes. you and your work. Yes. Please do, yes. All my books are listed on my website. Uh, some of them are unpublished. We, we do have some on Kindle. There's some on Amazon and also some of my books are available through iUniverse. I have a book being released next month in, in about three weeks' time. That is being released through Camelot Books and the book title is called The Publisher. And uh, it's, it's probably... I've seen it. That's with the eyeglasses on the front cover over a book, exactly. I believe. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's about a publisher who learns about his, his children have been kidnapped from school uh, through manuscripts that are being left on his doorstep. Must read. MaryBarBooks.com, am I correct? We'll yeah, my website it. is Mary-Bar.com. Excellent. Mary Barr, our guest today on the Bookmark Program. Mary, great connecting with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Mark.